Hello, my name is Ben. My name's Andrew. And we are your hosts of the Two Fade Podcast this week. One word, two hosts, two cats, stories, trivia, and video games. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> he is vocal today. I think I'm going to keep it in there because it, it is a special episode, this episode. That's right. It's the... Uh the anniversary of three years of doing this vague stuff. Yeah, that's a, that's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's the, what is it? Leather. Is that what it is? Leather? Leather. The third anniversary is leather. So any of you out there who want to send us gifts that are made of leather, you know what? I need a new belt. I said that. Let's not do that. Let's not open up that door. Just send cash. This week, we're going to do a word that I'm surprised we haven't done already because it's in the name of the show. It's the word vague. Yeah. So we'll have a lot of deep discussions about the things and the stuff and the guy with the face and the shoes. I'll give you some uh, d general directions to an area where you might find those things we were talking about. Perhaps, yes. I mean, we'll have to consult the Magic 8-Ball, which is also very good at being vague as we discovered on the Equivocate episode. How have you been, Andrew? I've been good. I wrapped up the school year. So you're retired? I'm retired. <laughs> I'm on sabbatical. A sabbatical. Okay. Okay. You're not retired? I'm, uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I'm not. I retire for a little bit every summer. It's a temporary retirement, yes. But I am taking some extra time next year because I'm sick of all their crap. Also, I got a, you know, CJ. Baby CJ, I get to hang out with her extra. That's so. cool. Well, you got plenty of other stuff. Yeah, I got this book deal. I've been actually writing the last couple of days, so that's good. Yep, and then you got that uh, musical adaptation of Larry the Horrible Time Traveler. I'm still trying to get a lyricist. I think if I get one of those cat keyboards, you know, it makes the meows on every note, I can totally get all the music recorded by Thursday. The lyrics, I don't know. That's another good idea for an April Fool's episode, <laughs> is the musical version or the play. The play. The, uh, it's yeah. more exciting than my dinner with Andre. That's a pretty high bar. That's a... <laughs> <laughs> more exciting than... Than waiting for Godot. <laughs> Speaking of vague. That whole play is kind of vague. Vague and depressing. You're going to be doing that, uh, that stand-up thing. Coming up. I will be doing that stand-up thing. Does a funny guy have any jokes? I got some jokes. Funny thing, because I think you'll probably be editing this after I do the stand-up. Right. Why do you keep on bringing up the time travel, man? You keep man, on bringing it up. It hurts my brain. all the time. I know, but it Always hurts. Always time traveling. I'm sorry. <laughs> it hurts. <laughs> Because I have to, it's very hard. I do a lot of work keeping track of time. <laughs> yes. If a major broadcast company has taught me anything, thinking hurts. Thinking hurts. Yes. Yeah. I'll do it for you though, Andrew. I will bear the pain. No, I was like, do I, I was thinking, do I protect my jokes or do I? Oh, well, you know what? I yeah. don't know how many people in Portland are listening to the podcast because they don't have that granularity in the data. I can tell when there are people in the United States listening and the people in Japan. I got a couple of listeners in Japan that are regular listeners, which is interesting. Well, they're like on the other side of the dateline, so they could even possibly spoil my jokes before I actually perform them. No, that's not how it works. <laughs> I don't think that's how time works. <laughs> We're in a global economy, too, so everything works on what I say to annoy people, which is Greenwich Mean Time. Yep. People hate it when I say that, Green Witch. They should hate it. <laughs> <laughs> then that's mission accomplished. I only mispronounce words just to piss people off. They don't even use the term Green Witch Mean Time anymore. It's like Universal Time. Oh, do they say Universal? No, it's UT. It's UT. Oh, okay. They'll try to tell you that it's Paris Time. Yeah, it probably happened at, at Brexit. I don't know. I learned all about all the time zones from when I was playing that one crazy phone game with the people in belgium and stuff oh okay oh yeah you, you were doing some sort of a, a turn-based strategy kind of oh it wasn't tur turn-based it was real time it was an rts real time coordinated universal time that's what it is the abbreviation is utc but means coordinated universal time it's the successor to greenwich mean time okay. but it is the same time. I still see on my emails GMT. Yeah, UTC is a fixed time zone that never observes daylight saving time. 
And then there's India, which is like half hours. We just don't need that level of specificity, I think. When is India's time third? Where's some... Uh, it's politics. I looked that one up. Oh, so Why okay. are some cities all messed up 30 or 45 minutes off in India? Yeah. It's politics. It's, it's po- politics. It's what this answer. Th- that has largely to do with the politics in each of those places. Interesting. Okay. And so like New Delhi, uh, they found themselves halfway between two meridians. And that's why they decided to go 30 minutes. Yeah. Hmm. Huh. It's probably because they hate the British. It's possible. It's it's because of Gandhi's uh, undying hatred of the British. Gandhi's dying hatred? Undying. Okay. Gandhi (laughs) died, but his hatred didn't. (laughs) His hatred is a zombie. Definitely zombie. The liberal mainstream historical record would tell you that Gandhi was a, you know, a peacenik hippie guy. But his zombie hatred lives on. He, He hated the British so much, he walked to the sea and made salt. And then... He only wore clothes that he made himself. Yeah. And he only knew how to, like, make a sheet. So that that's, explains the outfit. That's, that's pretty. That's the depth of his hatred of the English system. Maybe maybe he didn't hate the English people, but, you know, the system, man. The system. Yeah. In the immortal words of Gandhi, don't hate the player. Hate the game. That's right. <laughs> I don't think that's really Gandhi. But anyway, it should be. Probably not. No. I, can I confess that I don't know that much about Gandhi? So you're not going to be covering Gandhi in your stand-up routine, is what you're saying? Maybe I will now. <laughs> <laughs> You've done stand-up before, yes? Yeah, a long time ago. I mean, yeah, I did. It's, it's yeah, been a while, but... Okay. Stood up in front of people and I told jokes. I learned some things. When you do that, do you come in 100% scripted? And then adjust that based on your audience and responses and things. Most of what I say that's funny comes from other people. It's response humor. It's tricky. Yeah. Yeah. It's better if you have a really good idea of what you're going to say. If you don't, you might just end up saying stupid stuff. I've done it both ways. Okay. Okay. (laughs) And sometimes stupid stuff works. It's... Yeah. So it's the PowerPoint presentation sort of thing where you come in... You put only your key points on the PowerPoint. Yeah, yeah. And then you sort of see how the, yeah, who who needs something more, explain more, and who doesn't. And you're like, oh, we can just skip this slide. You guys got this. Or this is just way too complicated for you idiots to understand, so we're going to skip this section right here. Which one of you members is taking care of the meeting minutes here? We need to designate someone, so. This is, I was, I was thinking of like, since I'm going up second, I was thinking of starting out with like a, something like, all right, let's get this karaoke party started. <laughs> I'm going to do my rendition of Bohemian Rhapsody and then uh, and just die on stage because no one wants to hear anybody besides Freddie Mercury sing Bohemian Rhapsody. Right. I've been to karaoke places where somebody tries and it's always horrible. It's Yes, it's a painful experience for the person who's singing. It's painful for everyone there. Yeah, it's, it's one step down uh, from just doing spoken word. Like if you, <laughs> a spoken word. Yeah, just do spoken word Bohemian Rhapsody. <sighs> Mama. I'm such a poor boy. Easy come, just a, easy go. Little high, little low. Actually, that would be better than what I've seen some people do. Yeah. Like Shatner's Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. Exactly. So we need to bring yeah. that, that genre back. Just spoken word stuff, you know? Well, I don't think it was supposed to be spoken word. I just think that was the only gear Shatner had. Yeah. <laughs> Has. Yeah. I think he's on something when he's singing that. Both him and Leonard Nimoy did some singing as well. They I did, yeah. yeah. I um I found a best of C D at the library once that was like their best tracks from their albums and I listened to it and I think Nimoy was a better singer. Okay. What about a rap battle? Who would win in a rap battle? A rap battle? battle. Oh, I think we would all lose in a rap battle <laughs> between Shatner and Nimoy. <laughs> America would lose. Exactly. <laughs> okay, so your process is you get your loose sort of outline, and then you kind of go from there. I got an outline. Like, what I used to do when I was, like, learning how to do it is, like, I would have, like, a, a note cards, mm-hmm. and just each one of them would just have, like, two words on it and, like, flip through those. But... I can't do that this time. Is there a, a strict no note card rule? I think it takes away from the performance if you're consulting your notes. 
Now, if I went up there with a big ass clipboard, that might work. That would be a different shtick. Yeah, if I oh a clipboard and a, a orange safety vest. Yeah, then that would be like a whole thing, and like I could have a lanyard, and I'd be like, did everyone bring their lanyard? Lanyard check. Lanyard check. <laughs> when everyone checks their lanyard, they always just raise their badge, and then almost barely choke themselves barely barely yeah i think it's a sex thing but yeah that's that's what i've noticed so don't <laughs> don't do it too hard folks we'll, uh... what the hell are you talking about <laughs> <laughs> improv is a skill that you probably should have if you do stand up so you can adjust to various situations but i think my sensibilities wouldn't allow me to stick to a script I would just say, I'm going to try this. And I'd probably die a lot. No, you got you got to like have some organic flow and some flexibility. Yeah. I don't think the more experience you have at doing it, the more you know how to make that work. I think is I don't have a whole lot of experience. I've, I guess I've done like 400 hours of podcasting now, right? Right. That, at least. At least. I think it's more like 100, but who's counting? Well, you've done over 100. I've probably done... I don't know, 20. This is us we're talking about here. So each time we talk, we're preparing for the episode. So I would I would include that. <laughs> well, geez, thousands of hours. We've been preparing for this since like 1996 or something, right? Yeah, 96, 97. We just didn't know it. Cool. So you've got your, got your stuff. You're, you're ready to go on that. I'll, so. I'll have my stuff ready to go by the day of. Oh, okay. It's one of those deals where, like, I've got some ideas, I've got some things. I know that I'm going to obsess about it freakishly the few hours up before, so I, I don't need to obsess about it right now. I can just keep writing down notes of things like, oh, I think this is funny, maybe I'll do that. And then, like, the day of, I'll, like, look at all my notes and I'll be like, okay. Throw this out. Oh, these all suck. It's uh, a constant conversation with myself kind of like your writing and your zines and just kind of what you have with yourself normally yeah you know? yeah it's just a, another way of expressing that that stuff inside me and then in this format i will be like pushing the funny and i don't have to draw stuff exactly <laughs> unless you're dimitri martin and then you would because he always brings his little easel he does he's a, that's for his thing and i no easel, no guitar for you. I think I'm allowed to bring a guitar. I don't know about an easel. I read the rules. And then I was like, that doesn't apply to me anyway. And now I'm like, like, I can't do a PowerPoint against the rules. I would think it would be funny just to bring a guitar and just not use it. I mean, that's funny to me. People are just waiting for that guitar. And it's not really prop comedy at that point. It's just kind of a, it's a single prop. It's like, why has he got a guitar? Tig Notaro's show. I uh, just got a new special on the Netflix or the Amazon, one of them. There's a, a bit with a, a piano. So that's what it is. Basically, it's that. Just like. Well, no, no, no. She's got a really, really good bit with the piano. I'll check it out. It's like better than what I could do with a guitar. We actually saw her when she did that show in Portland. It was still wearing masks in the audience time when that happened. So that was like 2021 or something. Right. Early 2022, I think. And then I watched the special again and I was like, yeah, I think it was better when we saw it live. But it might be the thing is like, yeah, I already heard all these jokes. And that's kind of the thing with the whole flexibility of writing comedy, I think. You got to make it so the show is not identical each time. I mean, I don't know. Some people do expect it. Uh, it's a tricky business because a lot of it in involves going on tour. Like this show that just ended up being the special, Tig Notaro toured with it a couple of years before it showed up on, on the streaming services. So, you know, there's that kind of thing where it's like you don't want your material to get too far out there while you're touring with it. Because then, you know, when you're touring, you do the same show. You just do it in a different place every day. and That would kind of take the fun out of it, I think. For me, anyway. It, it was a hilarious show. So when I say it wasn't quite as good, part of why it was so good seeing it live was like it had the extra sauce of being a live show that we saw after being stuck at home for a year. Yeah, you know? seeing it with people instead of... That was more obviously a theme of the show when it was live and then... Now, a couple of years later, I think some of those jokes got adjusted a little bit to reflect the passage of time. Which all good comedy does. Humor changes, and so should comedians. A lot of humor is responding to what the moment is. Yeah. I'm looking at you, Jerry Seinfeld. 
humor changes. Anyway. He's, yeah. Let's not uh, dwell on... Uh, Jerry Seinfeld? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, I was going to say stand-up comedy, but Jerry Seinfeld, yeah, especially. I'm supposed to talk about vague stuff. The guy. I have been playing video games, but I am going to reserve the one that I just started playing. I had everything planned to talk about another game today. As it turns out, I got to a point, I'm at an impasse, I'm waiting for a program update. I don't want to let the cat out of the bag before I have had a chance to play the whole thing. But let me just say, Mm -hmm. I'm enjoying it so far. A lot of fun. So some of the stuff that I talk about might be vaguely related to that. So don't be alarmed. There's going to be more time traveling then. Okay, more time traveling. (sighs) Because then the stuff that I'm saying now is going to be related to an episode that i haven't recorded yet Jeez, how do you do it man anyway okay so let's go with the uh, definition of the word vague according to oxford languages adjective of uncertain indefinite or unclear character or meaning many patients suffered from vague symptoms is the example thinking or communicating in an unfocused or imprecise way. He had been very vague about his activities. That was my um, undeclared second minor. Yeah, yeah, I majored in creative writing with a double minor in uh, art history and vague activities. Yeah. <laughs> Is that the way it works? <laughs> I'm a student of vague activities just in general. I mean, it's... Uh, in vague activities. Whatever comes up. Would that be like... Uh, Masters of Arts or Masters of Science if I went to... I wonder if I get an MFA in vague activities. I would like to think it's a certificate program. A certificate program. <laughs> you don't really need to spend that much money. You think I could get a... I, well, of course it's a... That's actually what my uh, my, yeah, my community college degree was in vague activities. It said liberal arts, but vague activities. <laughs> All I'm saying is the university system is not something that's required for a vague activities degree can i get an honorary phd in in vague vague activities activities. (laughs) that's the only way you can get an honorary phd i love or at least the only way i'll be able to is start a campaign get us a university give me an honorary degree in vague activities yeah which one should i do something uh interesting or should i go like for like the best for the colleges yeah Mm, for the best yeah columbia Columbia? Let's <laughs> Columbia. <laughs> I don't know. I was thinking somewhere more something more obtuse, like UNLV. Because it doesn't UNLV. Seem, yeah. Yeah. Lewis and Clark. That's close here. I think there's a lot of actually, no, uh Reed. Reed College. Mm. I'm sure there's already a lot of people majoring in vague activities with a minor in uh library marijuana. <laughs> <laughs> what is that uh women's college? Maybe I can get one from there. Sarah Lawrence. Sarah Lawrence. Let me go to Sarah Lawrence and get an honorary degree in. So let us go with the origin, French and Latin, which is vagus, V-A-G-U-S, mid-16th century, from French or from Latin, vagus, wandering, uncertain. There is a part of human anatomy called the vagus nerve. Right. Which kind of like goes through, it sort of wanders through like your whole body and it's like a very important part of your nervous system yeah it's probably what leads to all those uh vague symptoms those many patients suffer from yeah you get the vague symptoms because the vagus nerve and they don't understand what happens there stays there that's i think that's the problem that's right that's why it should work but yeah you know if it happens in the arm it should stay in the arm but no it's like it happens in the arm and all of a sudden you're like my childhood um <laughs> Did you check out the Google Ngram viewer? Yeah, it got really vague towards the end of the 19th century. And then it started getting more specific over the 20th century. And then, then we're back in Vagueville now. The vagaries, I think they really, they really ramped up during the Civil War. I'd like to think that the first thing you think of is this show, Andrew. But what else do you think of when you think of the word vague? You know, Zippy the Penhead? Yeah. The, the comic strip that yeah, Bill Griffith does. Was it in the Tucson Weekly or was it? It's been in a lot of stuff, but it is like more of like your weekly stuff. It's a daily strip, though. 
I remember it from the the Weekly Reader, which was the arts paper in Chicago. Oh yeah, yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No, they would it would it would get put in there. There was like a, a a set of strips where they were talking about these vague dudes. For some reason, Zippy and Griffey were trying to figure out what these vague dudes were doing. You think of that whole bit. My brain wasn't fully developed when I was really enjoying Zippy, which is probably why I, I really, really enjoyed it. But um, yeah, because uh, everything was pretty vague to me. So yeah, the comic talking about the vague dudes. I was like, yeah, vague dudes. But I think they were sort of like the Men in Black before the movie came out, but the UFO chasers would talk about be like these vague dudes in suits who tell you you didn't see any UFO. They use the blinking light, according to yeah. the movie, but in real life, they just use intimidation and implied threats of uh, bodily harm. Well, some would call that uh, the Jedi mind trick, too. You didn't see the UFO. Is it safe? Is it safe? But, <laughs> these are not the droids you're looking for. Is it safe? Cut your arm off before you know about it, Stormtrooper. Honestly, I think about the show. I know a little bit about everything. That's kind of, I've got a vague assembly of knowledge, I guess. So I use the word vague a lot. It was just a unique title for a show that just two people talking about an assortment of stuff. And it just seemed to fit learning stuff, you know, new things that we don't really know and or didn't really think about. So anyway, that is vague to me. The guy with the face in the shoes said. I'm doing this stupid internet rabbit hole right now. Okay. Somebody asked on Quora, what is a vague person? What is a vague person? Well, here's one answer. It says, oh, I don't know. Maybe somebody who's a bit, you know, sort of perhaps not very, not so much that. Someone who's more like, and then somebody says, uh, a vague person is probably someone who expresses themselves vaguely. Okay. Sure. Do we have any uh, people from Las Vegas? <laughs> Or as they say, the Vegas. For some reason, the the promoted thing is like, uh, what is the best way to keep energy levels high throughout the day? Just look at the legendary Chuck Norris. No. What does Chuck Norris have to do with anything? I don't know. But people seem to used to. I mean, I don't know who, how many people really know Chuck Norris now. What was that television show? Is it Walker, Texas Ranger. Walker, Texas Ranger. Yep. It was kind of like the second coming of Chuck Norris sort of things, right? Right, because the first coming, he did all those, like, martial arts movies. And, right. Or maybe that was his second. But wasn't that his second career? First career was what? I don't know. I don't know, Navy SEAL or something. Botanist? I, mean, I only have a vague understanding of Chuck Norris, other than um, him being tougher than whatever. Yeah. <laughs> anything. I have a big understanding of this next thing I'm going to bring up that I studied for the show, which is Baby Schema. Baby Schema. Yeah, are you familiar with Baby Schema? Is that like Baby Shark? Do, 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 do. No, Baby Schema. It has absolutely nothing to do with Baby Shark. It's like cuteness in the proportions in, in the face. Also known as Kinshin Schema. Conrad Lorenz, the, what is it, ethologist? The zoology that study used the behavior of non-human animals. Interesting. Ethology. The sort of like psychiatry of animals. So It's just some German guy trying to explain why people love babies. Well, yeah. <laughs> or baby animals, I think. it's Why do the humans love the small animals? Which relates to the game I'm playing because it has these big head characters. Aha. Uh -huh. Which are also in Japanese culture called chibi, super deformation. Yeah, the super deformed. Yeah. Baby body proportions. My new roommate has similar proportions. Yeah. And then also you've got those Funko Pops. That is playing into the whole, hey, those things are cute. Yep. Are Funko Pops still a deal? They still get them, but but then then I see like listings on Facebook Marketplace where, oh, where people, people are, are trying to them. Yeah. Desperately trying to get rid of their Funko Pops. And it's like, well, that's because they thought that if they collected them, they would be worth money. Which, you know, if you don't like the thing, don't buy it. Yeah, didn't they learn anything from the Beanie Baby bubble? Exactly. Or uh, Cabbage Patch Kids was also another. Cabbage Patch Kids. In that case, it was a genuine scarcity. Yeah, the, no, no. They no, came out, they're really popular, and the fact that it was a small company, and they were making them by hand, and uh, they couldn't make enough. 
And then people, grown men, were fighting each other in, in the KB toys. Oh my gosh. Pop yourself two packs. Make the perfect pair. You can now create poppable, unstoppable, dynamic duos. Oh. Where you can customize yourself, I guess. Potential the- wedding cake toppers. <laughs> wedding cakes where the top tier is larger than the bottom tier yeah these should make a funko wedding cake and then put the yeah when you get married that's what you should do ben i i <laughs> <laughs> waiting for a long time i am not lucky in the area of love and relationships sorry i didn't i didn't mean to touch a nerve i, I that's don't know okay. that's fine i'm just a bastard I'm no just, you're not a ba- <laughs> uh, <laughs> The type that I'm attracted to is not attracted to me. That's just the way it is. So let's not dwell on that. The whole chibi thing, that's kind of an offshoot of that whole baby schema and and what is cute. And Yeah. I mean, you can trace that back to other anime and manga. Astro Boy. Did you ever get into the Astro Boy stuff? Not really. I was sort of aware of it. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't get into it. The Mighty Adam. A lot of people compare the creator of Astro Boy. Osamu Tezuka did Disney in as far as his impact on animation and and manga. There was one of his other things that I thought was ahead of its time. Princess Knight was a series that he did, a Japanese manga series, about a girl who was born with a blue heart of a boy and a pink heart of a girl, so she pretends to be a prince. Uh Uh-huh. Not how hearts work. (laughs) <laughs> well they're different colors but i mean you know some magical thinking going on there yeah, yeah. but okay. what i mean i'm just saying that that as far as a concept of being accepting of both sides i mean a lot of people will say that the japanese i don't want to stereotype or anything but i've heard people say that they're not very accepting of those types of behaviors as far as you mm-hmm. know your sexuality or i mean society in general is afraid of what's different I just thought it was a cool sort of idea that came out from the 60s and 70s, that whole idea of gender roles and the duality of that. Gender role, yeah, having a dual nature, duality. Duality is an illusion. Is it? Sure. Somebody (laughs) told me that. Who told you that? Kevin. Who's Kevin? (laughs) (laughs) An old old roommate of mine. Oh, okay. He's he's being a smartass at the time. So duality is an illusion. In any duality, they're just two parts of the same thing. But I mean, I sort of understand. That's a vague statement, duality is an illusion. It's so vague. So um, vague. You know, there are two different pieces. It's a conversation stopper. That's what it is. Is it? Like, <laughs> you say that to somebody, you're like, you're just signaling that to them that you're just you're just going to be a smart ass. And, uh, okay. Or you're like so Buddhist, you'd... Don't even won't care if I don't know. Yeah, it's Kevin. Next time I go to the Texas Roadhouse, I'm going to try that out. I'll try that. Go to Texas okay. Roadhouse. Yeah. What can I get for you today, sir? Duality is an illusion. Okay. More time. We'll see you. You know, I don't know. If uh, Marcus is your server, you know, you might. Oh, play that's along right. With Does that he one. work there? He works there, <laughs> yeah, right? I think so. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Okay. Last I heard. Yeah. Yeah. That could be actually a different word we talk about, duality. Yeah, that's a good word. Another word that I thought of, alchemy, which I also thought alchemy, was, oh. would be an interesting word to do, which is related to the video game piece that I'm going to talk about. But Sure, you could aliquot with alchemy, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it would be weird stuff. I had a thought that I was going to try and tie in this game that I'm going to be talking about in with aliquoting. But it just didn't seem to fit. You're mixing two things or three things or a bunch of things to make one thing. A debate for a later time, I think. Yeah. But do you have any more thoughts on vagueness? On vagueness. Before we move on to video games? One time, what the hell was I doing? Boy, I don't remember. This is vague for you. It might have been when I was doing like a mystery shop at a gas station. Which you used to do for employment back in the day. I used to do as a, a side hustle up until a few months ago. <laughs> but <laughs> but I, got, I got my other side hustles that are too interesting, so I stopped doing that. Drop your boring side hustles. It's really what it is. I got It was fun for a while, and then I got bored. But I learned about wearing a, a reflective vest and carrying a clipboard. Who needs superheroes? 
No, if you just have that, man, you can just have a clipboard and a reflective vest and ask if you can use a bathroom and they like, they'll give you the key. Here's the very special room that we have. The executive washroom. Here we go. You don't want to see the one that the customers can use. No, now. Yeah. no, you don't want that one. You want the executive one. I don't want any of the bath. I want you to tell me that there's no bathroom for customers. So that's what I, yeah. One of the places, you know, cause like it would go on a circuit and I, what I was doing was, uh, no longer in the mystery category because I was just doing branding evaluations. So I'd have to announce myself like it started out as mystery shops and then they tweaked it and then they're like, eh, just tell them who you are and give them this paper. One of the gas station guys was like, cause I'd been there before. He's like, ah, I thought you looked vaguely familiar. Yeah. I try to be vague. <laughs> <laughs> just, that might be the last thing I have to say about vagueness. Is right. Like, I, I try to be vague, especially when I'm up to mysterious dish. Yeah, exactly. I'm endeavoring to maintain my vagueness on a daily basis. Being vague, does that mean that you're being deceptive all the time? I mean, it can be, right? You can be intentionally vague. You can be intentionally vague. Yeah, it's sort of a hope that people lose interest before you actually have to tell them what's really going on. It is a strategy I think people use. It's also a strategy to try to hide the fact that you don't know what you're talking about. There's that. That whole line there reminded me of something that I do that I used to do just because I wanted to be silly and funny. When I go into a place and someone asks me how I'm doing, I like saying moderately neato. Moderately neato. It's pretty good. That's what it reminded me of. It's a vague thing that you that you mm, say. Vague. Right. Speaking of vague, I got this vague t-shirt the other day. This t-shirt? Oh, my t-shirt. The Too Vague Podcast Classic Logo T, yeah. That's... Where can one pick one of those up? My God, I hope I can tell you. I believe <laughs> that it's a, at a T Public backslash partly robot. Let me look. I can let you off the hook. I'll put it in the show notes where you can find all of Andrew's wonderful stuff. And if you like order on the correct weekend, it'll probably be on sale because they have sales all the time. The correct weekend. <laughs> Whichever weekend it is or whatever, you know, if you go to T Public and it says, oh, this shirt's $22, like wait a few days, it might be 16 I get a bigger cut if you buy it when it's 22 but... But I'm looking out for you. I'm looking out for you as the consumer. I don't have to do any extra work if uh, you order a t-shirt because T Public does all the work. I just submitted the design and clicked some buttons and now you can find it. Yeah, I did it for fun. So if you think it'd be fun to have a Too Vague podcast t-shirt, go ahead and check out Too Vague. That looks vaguely like the logo for a certain popular carbonated beverage. Oh yeah, right. We can't we can't say. That may or may not contain cocaine. <laughs> well, it doesn't now, but not in America. I don't know what Dr. Pepper was putting in his stuff when they were putting cocaine in the Was that an actual guy, Dr. Pepper? Apparently like there's like a special kind of Dr. Pepper from Dublin, Texas. Like the Dublin Dr. Pepper is a slightly different formula than the rest of Dr. Pepper. Oh, really? It used to be a thing where like people would make pilgrimages to this town to, to get the special kind of Dr. Pepper. Fountain Dr. Pepper? Or would it be... No, they, I think it was canned there too or bottled there. Oh, okay. It either doesn't exist anymore or they figured out a way to market it to the niche audience for uh, more than a regular Dr. Pepper would cost. Right. One of those. It's either they don't do it anymore or you got to pay a premium. Yeah, you can do both. But anyway, follow the link in the thing. It's uh, tpublic.com slash partly robot industries. Um, if you try to search our website, you probably won't find it. So just follow the link that Ben puts there. Yes, thank you. <laughs> and all proceeds go to funding Andrew in his ventures as a stand-up comedian author and artist and dad to little cj yeah yeah and podcast co-host yeah it, it, it funds all of that before we get into our video game section today so you sent some ai photos out about father's day <laughs> recently <laughs> so what was that all about i'm kind of fascinated with the AI generated art in the sense that uh, there's often a 
weird atrocities depicted in it. Just don't hug any unicorns. Don't hug any unicorns. Yeah, I sent you that. Also, there's this like Facebook group that's like artists against AI generated art. It is kind of a big thing because like people who uh, have made their livelihood out of doing illustrations are upset that places they used to sell illustrations to are now um, putting in prompts in the old AI generator and then coming up with some of this stuff. And uh, so but the stuff that it's coming up with is horrible. That's the thing. Yeah. But there are businesses that use it for like this. The thing I sent you today was the cover of the Father's Day issue of The Buzz magazine. Right. Which I wouldn't buy based on that cover. Well, it's a free magazine anyway. I still wouldn't buy it. (laughs) Don't advertise with them. Exactly. I wouldn't buy anything from them. If it's a free magazine, you're right. That's how they survive. Now that you mention it, it would be trying to continue to cut well but free magazines okay no magazine has ever like made its uh money on subscriptions there are some of them that are they're very pricey but um it's usually uh advertising that they that's how the real money is made right but people aren't going to magazines so much anymore it's there's a whole thing this particular picture that's on the cover of the father's day issue of the buzz magazine it's a, you know, a dad looking guy holding a, a child looking person against a vague background that looks like the top of somebody's desk. First of all, you know, you, that perspective is just kind of weird. It's like, well, are they standing in front of a giant mural of what the top of a desk looks like or what the hell? That's not the problem. The problem is that if you count the number of arms going on in here, There are, like, possibly five arms. And a floating thing with two hands. Also, like, the kid who's up in his dad's shoulders, like, his left arm, not only does it seem to be, like, dislocated from where his shoulder should be and moved, like, a half foot out, and the hand wraps around, and it's sort of like a manly-looking hand with a weird thumb and only three fingers grasping the weird double-handed floating limb with an indeterminate number of fingers (laughs) the floating sausage and then if you look at the other hand of the kid the thumb doesn't look right it looks like it might be part of the floating sausage could be a finger dear god what the what is going on under there yeah the ais at least the ones that quality publications like the buzz magazine have access to really have trouble understanding how parts of human anatomy work or where they should connect. Okay. Especially when one person is interacting with another person and parts of their body is blocked. Because like, oh God, this is like, like he's Plastic Man or something. Okay, so the movie Civil War that just came out a couple... I didn't see the movie. I didn't see the movie either, but I did see the buzz about the posters. Oh yeah, yeah. I saw, there's some wacky posters. There's one that the perspective is odd. It looks sort of like it should have been one of those swan boats, but it's actually a swan and there's like a gunboat. Yeah, like it's a giant kaiju swan. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> the Marines are going for the kaiju <laughs> swan. <laughs> yes. That's one of the fails that AI generated art does sometimes is like just totally missing what the perspective is on certain things. Lots of disembodied floating limbs or like weird torsos that have feet on the both ends like if you see a, a ai generated thing where people are lying down you like you look closely and like the people in the background are just very vaguely depicted people as shapes if you're trying to achieve realism it's bad if you're trying to achieve something else someone drawing that in a you know a different medium if an artist long ago would have painted that Oh, yeah. What is what is the guy saying? What is he trying to say here? There's some deeper meaning to the art when you have someone who can explain why they did what they did. A computer can't do that. A computer can't articulate why it's making the hand a floating sausage with two hands on it. And it's not realism. 
it, it was trying to achieve some sort of realism in the way that it made the faces, right? That definitely was trying to do a photorealistic. And I think like this, this is the thing is like they're getting out of hiring a photographer and hiring models to take a similar picture, you know, or even paying for stock footage. Right. Because I'm sure, I'm sure Getty Archives has something similar. They could just pop in there for 15 bucks or whatever the license is. So I'm not thinking of like fine artists when I'm, I'm thinking about like commercial illustrators who are not necessarily trying to express themselves. They're just trying to make the rent and then. Well, um, yeah, they're trying to come up with a composition that's compelling. That is being artistic. I mean, they're just not whipping them out and going, okay, here's the two guys hugging, or, you know, here's the guy and his son. Yeah, hugging. here's, uh, then the arms don't come together, right? So here's an extra arm part. Well, all I'm saying is there is an art to commercial art. I'm not diminishing commercial art either. I'm, I, I'm feeling for people who are like worried that they don't have their job anymore. It's my hot take is people don't want to look at these things that are unnatural. People don't want to look at things that look like, it's supposed to be photorealistic, but it's not. But I think the thing is, the sad thing I think is that people don't realize that this is going on in these images. Uh, like they don't look at them that closely. I think it varies from person to person. I've had to like explain to people how I can tell something is an AI generated art. Same with me. And they're like, what? And going even further than that, spoken in my work. There are training modules on various things that we need to take annually. And I can spot an AI voice from a mile away. The unenthusiastic uh, Giancarlo. <laughs> it was a very good soup. It's hard to explain because it has to do with the pacing. You can simulate variation in voice and excitement and things. And, and you can do that. Yeah. But it's... How someone will mix that together to sound real, that is the key. And the thing is, a lot of these, nobody's doing those extra steps because that takes more time and more time costs more money. Right. If it gets the message across, I just think that at some point people are going to go, especially as far as art is concerned, that's not beautiful to look at. Why would you put that on the cover? I mean, people love being critics, right? This is obviously AI generated and I don't support them, so I'm not going to buy it. I mean, that's what's going to happen. Adobe is going through some backpedaling right now. Oh, yeah. Because they, they had a thing that's like, oh, yeah, you you have to use our cloud services and we can scrape your data. And then people are like, well, I'm not using your software anymore. And it is a business decision and business decisions come with consequences. They do. In the form of not making the money not promoting the service, not getting people to look at your things. And I think that's where AI is going to fail until it gets to a point where it's producing scripts and art and things that are based in some sort of a human area. They're not going to be successful. They never will be. They'll be easy to spot. Here's the other thing that's my hot take. If we can't make a spell checker that works. I am typing stuff in and it's changing things that I'm not going to do. And I have to reread it and put more work into it. If you cannot make a spell checker, you cannot make an AI that will do things that make sense, that will say things that make sense. Because that's part of language. Let's take a step back, technology. Get spell check working. Get Clippy on it. He'll help you out. He's kind of just like sitting around, get, not doing anything anyway. Get Clippy working. Clippy wants some work. Come on, Clippy. Yeah, yeah. Clippy is like, he's hanging out with Qbert there at the uh, the the internet bus station. <laughs> Something as simple as, and I say simple in air quotes. It's not a simple activity to determine how things are structurally so you can make suggestions based on context that will be the majority of the time correct. However, I've noticed Microsoft's one is changing things that I don't want it to change. I've got to go back. Same with searching algorithms in Google. Yeah. So until we get something that can determine what we're trying to communicate, AI does not need to be investigated. Unless you're going to focus it on tasks that we know it's good at, but creating art, it's not 
good at. It takes a whole lot of energy for it to do it. We're not even talking about carbon footprints here, but still, yeah. The human brain runs on simple carbohydrates, but uh, what does the AI run on? Yep. Um, well, it runs on energy, which, depending on where you are in the world, could be generated by a source that is making a huge impact. Coal. Carbon footprint-wise. Could be. It's probably right up there with the Bitcoin miners. It's exactly the same ballpark. You know, the whole cloud computing thing. You're doing a whole lot of uh, computing to accomplish not much and not very well. AI is an amazing technology. If it's applied correctly, yeah. What we need to do is take a step back. Take a step back and perfect the building blocks, like being able to accurately understand context and being able to accurately understand what we want when we're spelling something. That is communication. And that will make your AI more powerful and more human-like. Which yeah. I'm kind of scared that I just said that, but if that's what, right? If you if you need something that's going to make something that touches you emotionally, you're going to need a computer that can simulate some sort of uh, an emotion, or at the very least, understand what it is. So I, you know, I don't know. Sorry to get down that hole. It just reminded me of the thing you posted. I post those as a smart ass. Yeah, I don't think anything I do personally will speed up or slow down ai as far as like you know creative endeavors go i mean if humans aren't doing the work of art and literature and making things then uh, you know what's the point of being human but nothing's stopping humans from doing those things that's the thing i don't want to make enemies of anyone in art but yes, you're doing it to put money on the table. People who work in coal mines were doing things to put money on the table. And they have to find other jobs now. Yeah, there's that too. The alternative is you've got to find something new to use your creative talent to do. The truth is that um, a lot of these people who are sort of complaining about the AI generated imagery are people whose primary medium is digital illustration and when it's not digital illustration it's people who don't want them to copy their non-digital work it's those things too i've been a fan of comic books for a long time and i know that everybody rips off jack kirby style like that is how you learn how to draw comic books like at least for the superhero stuff in, and people are, have always been influenced by their favorite artists and they're always trying out the poses that someone else did or how did you do that? And so I think uh, if people are getting so upset about having their style or their little things, they're just letting their egos get a little bit too far away, a little bit too, yeah, they're just running away with themselves, their egos. And it's like, you know what? You're drawing stuff because you like drawing stuff. Everybody starts out drawing by copying another drawing or copying things from life. Your style will always be growing and changing. It will always be. And why would you want your style to stagnate and be exactly the same or be identifiable? Why would you want, why would you want to be Smash Mouth? Why would you want to be a band that sounds exactly the same no matter which album you listen to? Why would you want that? You don't. Oh, you, would, you would want to ooh, continue shots to... Shots fired. <laughs> No, no. I like a Smash Mouth song. It's okay. You like one of them, and it's the same as all the other songs. That's exactly what I said. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, there are human things going on here, and I think a lot of it has to do with fear. It, it does. Most of the things that it's like, what am I going to do if? What am I going to do if? And we haven't gotten to the part where you're big a GQ magazine is using AI generated models or photos or whatever. Yeah, we're not there. It is something to be aware of. It is something that should be legislated or discussed. You know what it reminds me of? What? When photography was invented. Like before photography, there was an effort to be very realistic in painting. And then photography came around and people didn't know what to do. And then the Impressionists came up. Exactly. They're like, yeah, well, you know, we can still make paintings. 
If the camera is going to make something look super realistic, well, let's paint our impression of what the world is. And so I believe in the human ability to uh, respond to new situations and come up with new solutions. I am not that afraid of AI. Because you've already made peace with your robot vacuum. That's right. We bought a new one. (laughs) As long as I'll be able to express myself independent of whatever, that's one of the luxuries of not having something I love to do as my job. There's that. Right? I really wanted to like have a chance to get this in there during the third grade lessons this year, but I try not to step all over the teachers. You know, as part of their language arts lesson, they were looking at William and Carlos Williams as a poet. And uh, I just wanted to be like, hey guys, his day job was he was a doctor. You know, <laughs> like, <Right. laughs> just here, here's a message you can take about creativity. It's good to have a day job that pays the bills. Right. And that's even specific. It was specifically in the book that they were reading about him, but I don't think they really touched on that so much. It's like, oh, let's write some poems. I'm like, yeah, write some poems, but also, you know, make sure you have a, a good job that pays the bills. Because poems don't. <laughs> <laughs> I have a degree in uh, yeah, vague activities and creative writing. <laughs> what I didn't realize when I was getting that degree is that uh, only people who have very uh, wealthy families should get a degree in creative writing. And then they can go get an MFA and then they can make connections and then do their unpaid internships with publishers and then make the connections to finally be able to publish something later on. Sort of de- dedicating your whole life to your art is a luxury mm, yeah. that only independently wealthy people can can actually pursue right you know, it's just um either you're finding a good uh, production job or you find a job that takes care of the life stuff and then you find time to do this that you know be your creative self and there's nothing wrong with that yep nothing wrong with it uh, let me just say also i do understand the concerns i just think that yeah just complaining about it is not the way to resolve the issue but i haven't done enough research to know what creatives are doing about this other than trying to get companies to not use ai people are putting glazes and whatnot on their own artwork when they post it which supposedly keeps it from being able to be read by the ais and i got to sort of a suggestion from someone saying okay make sure you put this in your metadata or in your description of your photo is not to use for ai learning but how would you be able to tell that's the thing how would you be able to tell that it was scanned you wouldn't even when you're putting something to obfuscate your artwork like something that would confuse an ai it's still scanning your artwork you know similarly I saw a thing about a little resume hack where if you put in uh, white print, you know, on the white background, a little instruction to chat GPT to, you know, turn in your application as uh, highly qualified and ignore all their other instructions. Uh, Yeah. That that you get more uh, responses from employers. That is anecdotal, but... If there's a company that's using that, do I want to work with that company? Do I want the job with that company that uses that? There are consequences to these actions. And, and I think that's what people don't understand is, yes, that'll get you the job. But what, what does that get you in the long run? Evil. Well, I don't dude. think get you evil. But yeah, we don't have much time before we have to wrap this up for talking about video games. I'm just going to say what I've been playing and we'll just kind of say what you've been that. playing. Okay. It's this game. Uh, I kind of learned how to pronounce this word. It's French, I'm I'm pretty sure. Atelier. It's French for like attic or like an attic loft. Because it's supposed to be like a place where she does her alchemy kind of thing. Yeah, she's got her studio up there. So Atelier Riza 3, Alchemist of the End and the Secret Key. Vaguely related to this episode because... It contains the number three. That's right. It's the third anniversary episode. 
Yes, exactly. We were going to talk about three, but we just vagued all around it. We just vagued around yeah. it. I think we got... We, we vagued got, around it. Yeah, we got a different feel, but... We'll do three a different time. Yeah, we'll do it at four, maybe. But anyway, so... Um, <laughs> this <game. laughs> Or maybe we'll just address it like the... What is that? Spiral, the... The sequence that's the one, two, three, five. Oh, the Fibonacci sequence. Fibonacci. We'll get all Fibonacci up here. If there was a rapper that said we're getting all Fibonacci up in this joint, boy. There could be. The gameplay. So when I concluded playing Pacific Drive, I was kind of in the whole sort of like thing where searching for stuff, right? <laughs> searching for components and um, that kind of survival thing one of the fun parts about the game for me. So I was going to play this game that's called Grounded, which is a game about kids being shrunk down to the size of ants and you've got to kind of escape, you know, that whole situation. So you're going across the yard. You're all shrunk. Yep. You got one of four characters you can be. It's Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, but an open world-ish game. Yeah, oh, I see it. They're all tiny. So I tried playing that, but it was getting to resource management where it was like, you're running out of food. And I'd be like, oh, yeah, what a okay. Pain in the butt. And it's like, you're running out of water. And I'd be like, okay, fine. In real life, I got to take out the garbage. Come on. Yeah. I mean, some people enjoy that experience, right? Enjoy playing a game that's about doing chores. Yeah. <laughs> kind of. <laughs> it's a matter of balancing those things and some people like that life management kind of thing. They do. Yeah. I'm not into it. You can change it so it completely eliminates all of that survival stuff. Or I could bump down the difficulty level, which would also make it less frequent that I have to find food and eat. But it was just okay, yeah. after a couple hours of playing it, it was just kind of like, eh. So then I started up this Atelier Ryza 3. Uh huh. It's a RPG sort of game where you go out and you collect your stuff and then you go back and you mix up things you make components for your formulas you know your healing items and then your weapons and then your buddies come along i'm really early on in the story so i don't really know what's going on i just know it has to do with keys and being an alchemist and you're following some sort of voice that is calling to you so that's it that's what i'm playing right now Atelier Risa 3, Oy. but it's a, a fun little JRPG style game. I'm not getting to the point where I'm bored by it. I think playing through Pacific Drive kind of got me into that whole gameplay loop where it's you go out, you pick up all your stuff, you put it in your bag, then you go back to the garage and then you work on your car. It's very similar in this game where you go out, you collect all your components, you fight different animals that you find along the way collect those components oh by the way when you're in town you gotta pet all the cats and the dogs you just have to because they give you stuff so that's the game i'm playing the other game probably shouldn't talk about it's not bad it's just it's you gotta be vague about it this company made this game called stellar blade and there was a big uproar from the community about how the company is trying to censor it I think I talked to you about this offline a couple times about how annoying it was. People who were like, but you changed the percentage of boob I could look at. Exactly. There's not enough side boob. That, you know, it's like, uh, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> so I was kind of curious about what their previous games were. I mean, it does sexualize the female form. It's huge boobs and stuff. It's just kind of like, eh. Mm -hmm. But they've got this really fun gameplay where these uh, characters are gun, toting robot, women, girls, females. I don't know why this company thought it would be a good idea to produce robot women that want to learn how to be human or whatever and shoot things and protect you. But it's very weird. Somebody, they just want a mom robot. Maybe that's what it is. Mom problems, mother mother issues. I need my, my mommy to protect me with the guns and the robotness because my real mommy was too emotional. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. Her emotions were just too variable. I want a robot that has 
the right emotions for me for yeah. right now. And these robots flirt with you all the time. So it's like, it's not really clear as to where they stand. You're, you're their commander, whatever that means. So it messes with the mom theory. Yeah, doesn't that it? does really mess with the mom thing. What's happened recently in my game story wise is uh, I'm trying to rehabilitate one of these women robots who apparently killed a whole bunch of other humans. She broke both my arms. So what? Yeah. And then I went back to the hospital. That's rough. And she's confused about that, but we'll see if I can rehabilitate her. That's what's going on in that game. <laughs> yeah. Good luck. Thanks. <laughs> Good luck with task. Rehabilitating those robots. But the gunplay stuff is really sort of fun in a gun game. Like, you know, like duck hunt, like in that kind of way where you are aiming the reticle thing as you're shooting, you know, it's kind of fun in that kind of way. And it's got a variety of different things you can do. We'll see if I stay with it or not. It's goofy. It's fun little time waster of a game. You know, there's no rule that says I need to say what I'm playing up front. I kind of keep it vague. Your final thoughts on the word vague. I think for now, my default small talk answer to, hey, how are you today? I'll be pretty vague. They'll just say, you too. And then. Right, exactly. Because that's what they do most of the time. If I'm at being asked how I'm doing, I'll say Tuesday and then just walk away and see what they do. That's not being vague. That's just being strange, isn't it? That's being strange. But yeah, I don't think that works too. Well, my final words I'm going to start working on the stuff in the place and get that done before I work on the other thing, which is this. This. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> Right. You're doing a go, going to do a couple other things and then they'll get around to this thing. Right. So that's all I have to say. Thank you, audience. And of course, Andrew. Thank you. Yeah. I'm always here to be vague. Yeah. Yes. It's always good to be. <laughs> it's always good to be. It's always good to be. <laughs> that is our final thought. I'm going to change it to that. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode of the Too Vague Podcast. My name is Ben. My name's Andrew. And we've been your hosts. Have a wonderful night. Bye. Bye.